My name is Chuck Van Zyl. I live in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. It's an inner ring suburb of Philadelphia, right on the western border. And at the time of this recording, this interview, I'm 58 years old. All right, let's explain who the Nightcrawlers were. The Nightcrawlers was, the Nightcrawlers was a trio based in the South New Jersey area, just across the river from Philadelphia. Uh, a trio of performing electronic musicians. It was Peter Gulch and Tom Gulch, they were brothers. Peter lives still to this day, he's 71 years old, and he still lives in Camden, New Jersey, which he still lives in the same house. Uh, Tom Gulch lived in Merchantville, New Jersey, uh, and Dave Lunt was also in the Nightcrawlers, and he still lives in Collingswood, New Jersey. So the Nightcrawlers, they, um, for throughout the decade of the 1980s, they were a significant force in the electronic music scene in Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia area, uh, the live music scene. And to, um, I don't think they get the credit they deserve, but they were, at least to me personally, they were a very positive influence on, um, on my own personal development as a musician and uh, I'm sure to other people as well. Uh, they were active in the cassette underground. I don't know if people remember that still, but for many years, um, music was traded and bought and sold on cassette, like through the mail and, and through these uh, lists and stuff like that. Uh, they had uh, 30 or 40 cassettes available for sale that way. I think throughout the decade of the 80s, they played like 25, give or take a few concerts. That was stunning back then to see a, a band play with, a, with an actual synthesizer back then. And the Nightcrawlers were doing it quite frequently. They, uh... Like now, a lot of people are playing electronic music and you can kind of look to other musicians as a model. Oh, this guy has a laptop or this guy has some hardware synthesizers, you know, some actual synthesizers or a combination of the two or whatever. But back when the Nightcrawlers started out, there really were no other bands doing this. I think at that time, maybe Mother Mallard's Portable Masterpiece Company was the exception where they would, there was an ensemble of electronic musicians. And they even played in Philadelphia at St. Mary's Hamilton Village inside the church sanctuary. They played there, I think it was 1978. But it was a really big deal to see a concert where people were using synthesizers back in the 80s and in the 70s too. The Nightcrawlers started out as a duo. It was Tom and Peter. And I think the way it happened was Tom Gulch probably heard some space music or electronic music on the radio. I think that's how we came across it the first time. Maybe on Diaspar or on Star's End, which were broadcast on WXPN back in those days, and Star's End is still broadcast, even now. I think Tom went over to Third Street Jazz and uh, using his notes that he compiled by listening to the radio, I think he bought some, some Klaus Schulze LPs and some Tangerine Dream LPs and some you know, Jean-Michel Jarre and stuff like that. Actually, Jean-Michel Jarre and Kraftwerk you could hear on regular commercial stations in Philadelphia. So I guess there was some electronic or space music presence back then uh, in the mainstream. But he, uh, he was excited about this music, so he uh, shared these albums with his brother Peter, and they became really avid collectors of the space music albums. And they would, um, it was kind of new, it was really, like a, a new thing and it's a kind of exciting to be at the beginning of something like that you know when when these when these things are just just happening and and they were really collecting these albums when they were new in the early 70s and mid 1970s somewhere along the line they got to a point where they decided to buy some synthesi a synthesizer of their own and see if they could learn how to use it and make something approximating the music that they heard so i guess they did have a model but it was, it was, it was quite a leap, 
I think, to do that because you had to, to buy it, to go to a store and buy a, a synthesizer. Um, th that was very difficult. You know, you, there were, the music shops, they probably sold these instruments. They were quite expensive and they really didn't appreciate that you were coming in there to buy a, a synthesizer to do something weird with it. Now maybe, uh, uh, maybe it wasn't so difficult because they, um, they came to understand the, the names and all the different models and makes of synthesizers by looking at the albums that they were listening to. And in, as is often the case with those older albums, they would list all the gear that the uh, artist was using. Uh, and so somehow they wound up um, mostly buying Japanese equipment. Uh, Korg or Roland were, uh, were, were made up most of the, the, the instruments that they bought. And they really bought a lot of instruments because they would get one. It was expl I didn't know them back then, but it was explained to me that they would get an instrument. And I do know their personality. I do know that Tom and Peter are very, very smart I can imagine that this was an interesting challenge for them to learn how to use these instruments. The manuals were not all that helpful because they were written in a broken English because of, um, um, well, the, the, the manufacturers just didn't put all that much effort, effort into making a manual that explained, uh, you know, how these instruments worked and what all the controls meant and stuff like that. And so one way or the other, they commanded a mastery of these instruments and then they would go buy another one. But uh, Peter and Tom, they really were attracted to creating these moods and, 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 and in, in, the live, in, in a live setting, in real time. And so they would, they bought a lot of different gear. The gear was probably state of the art at that time. Uh, even though they were monophonic, or you know, the, they, they you know would only be able to play maybe two or four notes at one time, they built up a, a decent collection of synthesizers, and since they had had this mastery of how all the controls worked, and also this great basis for what the genre is, like you can't go to school to learn what space music is. You have to go to concerts or you have to, um, you know, listen to these older albums, you know, where the, uh, the music like just, you know, seemed to spontaneously uh, come into being, you know, out of Berlin, Germany. Um, there's no school to learn how to do that. You had to just, you know, make, make your own. And I think they were at a critical point where they had a vast collection of this music and had, you know, really enjoying becoming familiar with it and learning about it and 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 that uh, caused them to buy their own gear and start so they started making sounds together and I, I think at the time neither one of them knew how to play music I think Tom Tom Gulch eventually he took piano lessons and I think Peter probably taught himself on his own how to read music or how to um, how to play music, um, and so they started jamming together. You know, they st in their house they started just assembling all the synthesizers that they had, and and I guess they had you know played through a stereo or they had a little speaker or something that they could play through, and they started um, recording these sessions on a uh, on a boombox. Oh. Now, so Peter had one of these and he would just put it in the room uh, where the jam session was happening and put a cassette in and press play and record and it would, um, it would just capture whatever sounds they made in the room. And so the, as you might imagine, these recordings sounded kind of crude because they were, uh, you know, they were not like fed in, the audio signal was not fed in at line level to the recorder, it was just recorded like through the air by the speakers, you know, coming through the speakers that were, that they were using to monitor their sound. And so if something happened outside, that would get on the tape. Or if somebody came to the door, that would get on the tape. Or if the chair creaked or something like that, that would get on the tape. And so uh, they would actually, um, I think they would try to uh, 
to make these recordings so that um, so that they would fit on the, the this one set would be 30 minutes long, which was the length of a C60 cassette. But I think most of the time they would just lose track of time and uh, I really you know and just get wrapped up in the experience because when you're playing this music, and I think maybe they were among the first people to learn this is that you get into this different mental state of listening to the other person and deciding where to place your sounds it's like uh, it's like kinetic art you know it's it's uh, it's art that's not static it's it's a constantly living thing that expires out or that transpires over time and I think I don't think they understood, but I think they were feeling that, and I think the, um, you know, making these recordings were an actual byproduct of that. Most all of the cassettes were made on low noise Agfa or some, you know, some real cut rate ba brand that he could buy in volume or in bulk. I, I, I still don't understand this. Uh, maybe someday I will. But he said he liked the sound of them. Now maybe because. You know, the, the high end is rolled off and uh, there's a lot of hiss and there's not much of a low end on it. Maybe he, maybe that's what he liked about it, I don't know. Or maybe he just liked buying the cheapest tape possible. But we'd buy like boxes of them with, no, you know, and they'd be blank uh, with no, uh, they'd be totally blank. The exterior would not have a label on it or anything. And uh, so he would make you know, a recording of a concert, and if it was a good set, or, or a recording of a jam session or a practice session, in the uh, in the garage or whatever, and if if, they, if he liked the way he turned it out, he would um, put it aside and label it master. And then when when someone ordered the tape, he would just make a copy of the master. And so, as we know, with tape uh, technology, every time you play a tape, it wears down a little bit and loses some of its fidelity. And so all these tapes over the years became gradually worn down. So I'm not sure of the condition of them. Maybe they, maybe they still sound okay, or maybe they're just not quite as vibrant as they first were, but they really weren't all that vibrant to begin with, I don't think. Uh, um, they learned about, a, um, about an electronic music festival in 1979, and I think it was December 7th, 1979. The festival was called FOPPEM, F-O-P-P-E-M. It was the Festival of Performing Philadelphia Electronic Musicians, or something like that. And they had a, they had a, a gallery at 253 North 3rd Street in Philadelphia where they could, uh, where they would have these festivals like once a year, I think. In 1979, it was the second year they uh, had uh, had done this, and you, to get a, to get to be selected for this festival, the musicians had to submit a tape to Charles Cohen, who was curating the series. It was a chance for uh, for people to, like the Nightcrawlers, to to do their, you know, to come out and play their music in front of people, which is a much different experience than just playing in your in your bedroom or in your garage with each other. So Peter and Tom, they submitted a tape, and Charles Cohen liked it, and I don't know what was on the tape. I, I have a vague notion of what might be on there, but it was, uh, so they were selected, and that was their, that was their first concert at, at, at FOPM. It was a really a, a very uh, transcendent experience for them. I was told, you know, that they were really nervous. I think they played for 30 minutes. And uh, they made it through the set pretty good. Uh, the, the, the set concluded with Peter reading a passage through a microphone, through a ring modulator. And it gave his voice like an alien, kind of metallic special effect. Uh, but he read a, I don't know what passage it was, but he, he read a, a section out of the Book of Revelations, out of the New Testament. And I remember I knew somebody was at that concert. And they said, oh yeah, and at the end this guy got up and read some science fiction story. Between the first FOPM on December 7th, 1979, and the second FOPM, which is December of 1980, they met Dave Lunt. 
and I think he was recommended by a, a friend or an acquaintance or something like that. And they got together and they jammed. I think, I think they got together and jammed with some other guy, but it didn't work out. I don't know anything about that guy. But they met Dave, and and something really clicked. And it is an interesting. Um, I think it's an interesting combination because uh, the way these three different minds worked. Uh, Peter and Tom kind of came to this like from a, almost like an engineering standpoint or from a from a really experimental standpoint. And I think Dave Lunt, he came from it. He was a little bit younger than both of them and a little bit more experienced in music. And he had a, um, he had a background in playing in rock bands and just a more extensive training and experiences in playing live. And you can really hear it when you listen to him playing lot solos and the way he carries himself in these concerts. He's very confident. And on the albums, you know, he's, he's got a, a great sensibility, a great melodic sensibility, I thought. And he really was able to um, give their music a, a more contemporary sound, like a little more, uh, maybe a better finished or a glossier sound. A little bit. Not, because he also was able to, well, he just had a wide, a really wide, Dave Lunt had a really wide uh, background. Uh, he had he knew a lot about a lot of different kinds of music, and he was able to uh, draw on that in some way in his work with the Nightcrawlers. So they 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 jammed together. I think maybe the first time they jammed was in uh, one of the a bedroom at maybe at Tom's house in Merchantville. But eventually they started using Tom's garage uh, to. Uh, to, to practice it and I think they even had to uh, I think I remember hearing they all had to like the, the, the roof was leaking and so they all chipped in a couple hundred bucks and they hired a roofer and they uh, and, and they fixed the roof and I guess that set the stage for collaborating on albums and, and other things they would wind up spending money on uh, as, as a group you know um, so the Nightcrawlers they, they started out as just Peter and Tom uh, they did that Fopham in 1979, and then they added Dave Lunt, and they played the second, or the, they played at Fopham again in December of 1980 as a trio. And then from from then until uh, uh, you know 1988, they they played live. They played like 25, maybe more concerts than that, and they actually were active recording music. Uh, up until 1991. People might already know about the Nightcrawlers because they became well known uh, for putting out cassettes. And earlier I explained how the cassettes were made, almost all of them were made on low noise tapes, you know, something like this. You know, with uh, you know, handwritten labels with uh, photocopied J cards, and even some of the text on the cards were were handwritten or, um, or 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 printed out with a typewriter, like a desktop office typewriter, with uh, covers that were uh, made by uh, fans or just um, you know these weird drawings or like computer graphics, which were kind of new at the time. But they were recorded by means of the boombox in the garage over at Tom's house in Merchantville uh, over the open air microphone of the boombox. They would record all of their concerts. So uh, if, if a particularly, if a concert came out particularly well, they would probably release that as, uh, as, as a cassette also. And it's interesting to read all the different names and of the cassettes and all the different look at all the different artwork and uh, it would be nice to be able to listen to all the different music too but it's kind of hard to find these cassettes nowadays they just they were sold for like four dollars a piece I think you know maybe plus postage you would send the money to Peter in Camden and uh, you could learn about these uh, through magazines like Option or Sound Choice or just weird independent magazines or you just learn about them uh, learn about them like through friends or something, there was not a decent way to 
to uh, to to market these cassettes. I guess I guess Peter sold a lot of them at at uh, concerts and stuff too. But but uh, in the end, he issued uh, like 30 or 40 of these cassettes, and that's a huge number of albums to put out um, of these live these live concerts, these live jam sessions that they would have. And I was told that sometimes they would jam, they would do a jam session, they would just stay all weekend long in the garage and jam, just just lose track of time and just go and go and go and go. And I guess they would, you know, stop and break every now and then to change the tape out, but I really admire that, that they were just playing for the sake of playing. They weren't really practicing for a concert or they weren't trying to make an album. They were just playing and jamming and having these amazing experiences in sound just for the sake of doing it. Or, or, or maybe, I guess the byproduct was they, they forged a better connection with each other that way. Once that happens in a group, the, um, the group is, uh, you know, adheres, it adheres together better you work together better and it's actually an interesting and unique bond just in life let alone in, in a musical context to be connected to somebody that way to have like a, a really heavy sonic experience like these it's it's intimate when you play you're playing all this music and you're not you're not stopping to talk you're you're, you're just listening to what the other person's doing and you understand where you're supposed to go or where where the piece is supposed to go and you're not conflicting with the other person it's a really special feeling it's like a unity that happens between all the different people and it's rare and I think the Nightcrawlers were able to achieve that and that's one of the aspects of of what made their what made them continue on for all those years now eventually they began to play at more and more concerts they didn't go out and set up their own concerts. They never did. Um, they would always wait for someone to invite them. And fortunately, in Philadelphia, there was a decent scene. And so they were, you know, playing a few times a year, or, you know, several times a year. Uh, sometimes they would travel outside of the area to festivals or to other parts of the, the region and, and play, you know, for, uh, you know, somebody would get it together and have a concert somewhere and they would go and play. Um, but for the most part, most of their concerts took place in the in the Philadelphia area. That's where most of the people were, and the Philadelphia area was serviced by uh, uh, the radio sh show Diaspar, broadcast on WXPN, and so it was pretty easy to get word out about um, an innovative music concert by way of these airwaves, because the audience was interested in these things. Uh, most of them were interested in you know different dimensions of the music so they would it was easy to not easy it was always anyone who is presenting innovative music or outside music it's never easy to to do it's you're always battling the apathy of the audience uh, trying to get the, uh, the, uh, the message out to the audience that the event is actually happening and there's just all these roadblocks trying to get people to come to concerts but in the in that beautiful era, a concert could be announced on the air and a decent sized audience would come for it. They would come and experience it and, and people still talk about these things, you know, there are old, people my age, you know, still remember that stuff and, and um, it was really a unique thing. It was really a unique thing. They were weird guys. They loved what they did and they really just wanted to come out and have an experience in front of people or with people because that experience was different than this jamming at the garage uh, and on some level they, they wanted to share this with people it got them some level of notoriety you know they're still kind of among certain circles even today they're kind of legendary like to me they are you know to think back on those days it is like a mythical or a legend legendary that, that these things happen even though I'm still doing this music along a continuum of you know 30 or 40 years it still seems kind of magical to me like a lot of well, well, well I mean I have various motivations and I become motivated in different ways but one of the ways I became motivated with uh, 
towards this music was seeing how excited other people were about it, how the DJs on the air here at XPN were, and how the musicians were, and how the, the, um, the community was, the audience was. Because going to a Nightcrawler's concert, where there'd be, you know, 50, 100, maybe 200 people, sometimes there'd be 500 people, sometimes there'd be even more than that, at least once there was more than that. Be a lot of people. That's a, that's a lot of people to be a com part of a community with, and um, it's exciting. You get you know there's it's just, there's you know we're stronger that way as as a group. So after playing several live concerts, and you know, getting the feedback and the excitement from the audience, they were positive experiences. I, I, I'd been to a few of the concerts. And at the, after producing numerous cassettes and marketing them in some small way and selling them uh, to fans through the mail, they thought that their music became as good as the albums that they had listened to that inspired them in the first place. You know, like albums like Phaedra, or uh, Cyborg or Ehrlicht um, or maybe even Departure from the Northern Wasteland you know those those sorts of albums and so they decided to record they decided they were gonna make their own album and so by doing these jam sessions you know among themselves and by playing these by, by being fortunate enough to have you know several concerts under their belt they picked out four pieces and decided to make definitive versions of these four pieces. The four pieces were Spring Torsion, Traveling Backwards, Tonswood, and Modulus 4. And I think they all had come out as cassettes or parts of cassettes or they had done them live, but when they sat down in the studio to record them they came out significantly different than the live versions did. They went in the studio and they recorded these four tracks uh, as multi-tracks you know they weren't like live jams they, they actually did it in, in, in a studio and so they really took their time and 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 crafted crafted the music so that it was uh, concise and tight and I thought they recorded these at a, at a studio in South Jersey but uh, according to the liner notes on the album they recorded it at Dave Lunt's house and uh, this happened in the summer of 1983. Uh, they, they, they did these sessions and uh, mixed them down. And at the time in 1983, 1984, when they, were, uh, when, when they decided they wanted to put an album out, they, there were very few places that would actually manufacture an album for you in uh, small quantities. Uh, they, I think the minimum quantity was a thousand. I think there was a place called Wakefield out in Ohio where there was, well there was disc makers in Philadelphia and they're still around today but uh, it's, it's kind of a different organization but uh, you could get vinyl made at disc makers and Wakefield and um, I don't know there were probably some other ones. I don't remember which plant the Nightcrawlers used. They got their act together, they pooled their money and they got a thousand copies of this first album with these four tracks and man it took them like 10 or 15 years to sell all of these things because they could sell them at concerts they probably uh, sold uh, 25 or uh, maybe a couple hundred of them through mail order services like Yurok or Wayside Music or their back roads there were you know places that those were the common places they could sell albums or, or, the, or that independent musicians would sell albums back in those days so they sold them uh, mail order. You know, Peter probably took out ads in um, different fan magazines or different publications that were available, and that was kind of a lot of money to put, uh, you know, an ad in a magazine and maybe get two or three orders out of it. You know, it'd be better to get the album reviewed. I guess he sold some overseas, you know. But this album, this album, a lot of people had this album and uh, know about this album. I was pretty ama I was pretty amazed when when this uh, when this first album by the Nightcrawlers came out because done I didn't know it was possible like when I I thought only labels like RCA and Warner Brothers and 
you know, on these import labels too, you know, like Brain and uh, Cosmic Carriers. And uh, I thought you had to be a label to put music out. When I saw that, well, I don't know, somehow it clicked in my head that like, it was, it was a turning point for me that, that I understood that, what, what, and it seems like a simple thing because now everyone is, in this era, everyone is putting out their own music. But it was, to me, it was a really big deal to do that years ago. Um, in 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 the mid 1980s, it was it was very expensive, and I think there were a lot of um, obstacles to doing it. But during the course of of uh, being admitted to the WXPN staff and being a a diaspora and a Stars End DJ, uh, one of the things I found. I don't know if I found it on my own or I heard someone else playing it. But it was a reel-to-reel -reel tape, but the white box had some handwriting on it and it said, The Nightcrawlers. The Flight of, the flight of Baba Yaga. And the time, and like it said, Tales Out or Tales In or something like that. I figured out how to use the, um, I figured out how to use one of the reel-to-reel -reel decks and you know, threaded it, and I listened to this piece of music, and it was really interesting. I I had the the term the flight of Baba Yaga as as far the only other reference I have to that is from a piece by Mazorsky. It's uh, it's the name of a piece in the in the bigger piece called the Pictures at an Exhibition. Well, I had I had both albums. I had the Mazorsky album, uh, you know, the the piece composed by Mazorsky, and then I had the updated version with by Emerson, Lake, and Palmer as well. And um, so that name, like, I knew, I knew that name. And, and, so when, and so, I don't know, that gave me like a, a small connection to it already. And I listened to this thing and I, I still can almost hear it in my head. It was, I could definitely, it, it sounded odd because it was, uh, it was not like, you know, the other space music albums I'd been listening to because it was, and I realized later that it was, it was recorded, um, through an open air mic, you know, and, and so I don't know. These, it was just the whole experience was like a new encounter for me, because I was thinking like, well, how did they make this? Was this at a concert, or did they, you know, set? Why did why did they set up the microphones in front of the speakers, or why did they choose it to do this way? And 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 the and the, the fidelity was kind of compressed too. I don't think it had a full bandwidth, you know. It, it was kind of so, but um, the thing I'm remembering is that it really conjured the flight of Baba Yaga. Uh, not in a, in a way the uh, Moskorsky piece, but just, it was, it was kind of mysterious. You know, the flight, of a, the flight of a witch on, you know, All Hallows' Eve or something like that. It, it really captured that. It was kind of minimal. It was kind of crude. Uh, you know, like it was a few degrees more crude than say Phaedra, you know, that piece of music. Um, and, but there was this unusual energy to it. And so I think I wound up playing it on the air at some point. You know, it was a real pain in the neck to play a, um, you know, it was hard enough creating these shows spontaneously just from, you know, a big pile of albums and, and, and some ideas and, and some, you know, knowledge that you have worked up over the years of all the music. But then to throw in like, you know, this reel-to-reel -reel tape at the same time, you know. But uh, I wound up, you know, playing it, and and, uh, and and gosh, that was that was 1980. That was like 36 years ago. I remember this. That's the first time I heard of the Nightcrawlers, and I think the uh, the first time I ever saw them play was at St. Mary's Hamilton Village in the in the uh, parish hall. I'm pretty sure that's the first time I saw them, and it was a double bill. It was Tangent and the Nightcrawlers, and uh, I think this was, uh, you know, like 1983 or something like that. I, I remember this concert because, the, along with Tangent, uh, the, the duo Tangent and the Nightcrawlers playing at this concert in St. Mary's Paris Hall, uh, this light show was taking place and it was by this guy called himself Quasar Light Show and he would do um, he had all, 
a bunch of slide projectors and all these weird slides that he had made or s somehow photographed or created. And he had these overhead projectors uh, that were, um, you know, casting. Well, I don't know how it's done, but there it would be like plates with oil and, and you know, this projection this was real trippy. And he had these other lights that he uh, projected and he had made them himself or it was it was really cool you know to have this have this light show projected up while the band played it was there wasn't a screen or anything he just projected it up on the on the band at some point he just turned on everything and the fuse blew and all the lights went out and all the instruments turned off and the pa turned off and that's a, that's a really bad situation in 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 any live performance but also when the power comes back on, it could like, the, the, you run the risk of like uh, frying some of the delicate electronics of the instruments. So everybody had to, you know, find their way up, you know, get flashlights out and find their way up to the instruments, turn them all off, uh, turn all the lights off. And then somebody had to go down the basement, find the fuse box and put a new fuse in it. And then when they finally turned everything back on, when the instruments were t turned on again, they, because they had a volatile memory. Uh, they had it all. They had to be reconfigured all over again, and so it was. Uh, it was crazy, you know. But that was. I think that was the first time I saw them. When when the Nightcrawlers started playing concerts in front of people, they sort of had to polish their uh, set a little bit. To, to make to make it um, more have at least some access point to the audience, uh, th their jam sessions in the garage were real free form, sprawling sound explorations, and and it, it must have been really fun. I, I only went one time over there, uh, and 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 got to sit, th you know, through one of those things, but uh, I, and I think it was a uh, may, may have been a rehearsal for a concert, so. It was it was less uh, it wasn't so much new ground covered. They were trying to get ready for a concert and present something that they had envisioned and formed ahead of time, and that was new to them. And I, I think for I think for Tom and Dave, they uh, they really wanted to do that. They they had you know, Dave certainly had a, a, a skill and proficiency in playing keyboards and an understanding of music, and Tom had developed one over the years by taking piano lessons with, there was some lady he would go there like once a week or something like that and and, and, and learn how to play the piano like from, you know, from the basics on up and he had gotten, and he'd gotten very good at it. But Peter didn't care, I don't think he really cared about all that stuff, but that might just be an extension of another aspect of his personality. I feel like I'm qualified to talk about the Nightcrawlers or to, be an authority on the Nightcrawlers uh, for a couple of reasons. So one reason is I produced two of their two concerts that they did. I know they did a lot of concerts over the years. They did like 25 or more, you know, plus or minus 25 concerts. And I produced two of them. One of them was on December 6th, 1986. It was at the Asbury Methodist Church in West Philadelphia. That's not there anymore. It burned down a long time ago. It's a parking lot now. Um, and the other concert was at the Tabernacle Church in, um, that was in 1988. And um, both times my group Exile opened up for the, um, for the Nightcrawlers. And they were both concerts were very well attended, uh, by the way, which was, which was nice to have, uh, you know, have, have break even and, and not, not go in the red to, uh, produce the concerts. Well, another reason that makes me qualified to speak about this is I, I helped produce their last recorded output. It was a double cassette called Barriers. That was 1991. In fact, here's uh, it was it was a double cassette. It was kind of a rare, unusual, uh, unusual medium. You know, I mean, a lot of people were putting out cassettes, but uh, this this double package was this double cassette package was a little unusual and uh, unfortunately I can't at the moment I can't find the uh, the cover to this album I have to keep looking through my house uh, so so yeah this I, I, I 
help put this out. I, I didn't finance it, but I, I did facilitate its production. Well, it was it was a great pleasure of mine to get to know the Nightcrawlers. Uh, initially, I got to know them better through doing interviews on the air with them. I was a host of Dias Bar uh, primetime radio program in Philadelphia on WXPN, and, and when the Nightcrawlers were going to do something significant, you know, like release an album or um, uh, or, uh, or play a live concert somewhere, they would come in and get interviewed live on the air. And so we would talk about their music and their background and play some uh, examples of their music and uh, direct uh, listeners to go see the concert and, and have a, a good, interesting experience, you know, an un unusual experience, uh, different from, you know, mainstream commercial ventures, uh, mainstream music. The, the interviews would include all three of the, the guys, Tom Gulch and Peter Gulch, and Dave Lunt would attend, but Dave Lunt was very shy, or uh, for whatever reason, he would have a microphone and and be there listening, and and um, and only very occasionally participate. So the interviews were quite often just uh, the you know the host of the, sh the radio show and Tom and Peter. But when the concert would happen, I would go to the concert, and I began getting becoming interested in. Uh, in how the music was made, because I'm, you know, I was watching a concert happening, and uh, it was, it was still quite mystical, or it was just unknown to me how these instruments worked, and uh, how to operate them, like what, how you would learn how to operate one, how, how you could afford to buy one, or how many you need. I just had a million questions, and so after the concerts, uh, since they had quite a bit of gear to pack up, it took a while. And most of, and all the audience would leave, except I would stay. And when um, when things settled down, I would talk to them. And and so beyond asking the questions, we developed a friendship that way. I guess it also helped that I would, since I was the only one out of the audience that stayed, I would help them load up the trucks. And so anybody who helps you load up uh, after a concert is is your friend, you know. So so that was a. Um, that was that was uh, that was helpful in in establishing a friendship with these guys, and um, I guess I had you know pretty close friendships with all three of them, and but but they were all a little bit different. Um, uh, I, I became friends with Dave Lund. I really admired the way Dave played. I really admired his lead solos, and I admired what he added to the band. You know, he brought this really musical sense. Now now not that Peter and Tom were like strictly engineers. But I don't know that Dave had this very artistic or this, and I think in this kind of music, um, it's really about texture and about sounds. And so it helps if you know a lot about playing music, you know, like how pop music works or how to play rock music or how to play jazz or whatever. But you have to kind of, you have to turn that off, like those, that knowledge and just play music uh, that's informed by what you know, but doesn't guide what you know. You use something else to, guide the music and I, I I don't know I thought it seemed to me that Dave was able to do that or Dave brought that to the music uh, to the music of the Nightcrawlers. Uh, we also uh, both uh, were interested in photography. Dave, Dave was a professional photographer and so that I always found that interesting and uh, the, you know to talk to him about that and I guess in general he was uh, uh, he was at an artistic level that I aspired to be like as a person you know, he could talk about the, the technical and the craft aspects of, of things, but uh, if you coaxed him, he would also talk about, you know, the, uh, the values of, uh, you know, the artistic values as well, which is it's hard to get people to talk about that. And so I, I learned a lot from him, and I guess I learned a lot from all three of them. That maybe that's maybe the, the, most, the most telling feature of our, of our friendship was that I learned a lot from them. Now, now, Tom, I became really friends with him. I, I don't know, we both kind of had the same sense of humor. or There was something where we connected. He worked for the United States Postal Service for many years, and so did I. And so I, right away we had, you know, we could commiserate about, oh, how awful things are at, at, at work, you know. So I don't know, I think we both enjoyed that about one another. But he also really taught me a lot. And the, the, the thing that he wanted me to learn was learn music. And he even bought me a book of chords and you know to try to learn how to you know read music or 
at least figure out what the chords were, you know. He, um, I, I think he was frustrated, you know, that as I developed as a, an electronic musician, I, 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 I spent more time uh, gaining understanding and knowledge of the, the technical and the sound design aspects of the synthesizer, but not, you know, the musical, uh, you know, the, the musical, the, the Western musical aspect of it. Um, and Tom and I played in a group together, it was called Exile, uh, for, for a time. Um, and that was, um, you know, like the first serious concert I ever did was with him. Uh, we, we made a cassette called Winter's King, you know, over at his house. We, would, we jammed and it was kind of atonal. And there was a lot of fighting and carrying on and it finally got done. Actually, when I would go over to play, we would spend like half the day at Ponzio's Diner. Just drinking coffee and eating and hanging out, you know, and keep telling stories and stuff. And then we'd realize half the day was shot. And then we'd go back to his place and start start playing and start, you know. And I had never, I'd never done anything like that. So he really helped me learn how to how to do that, how to play, or how to at least the beginnings of how to play a live concert. But he was really frustrated because I didn't know anything about musical chords or or counterpoint or. You know, anything like that. Um, yeah, unfortunately, Tom died in, in 2013, and uh, that was a great loss. He, um, he had suffered some physical debilitations from his uh, stemming, probably stemming from his time in the, in the Air Force, when he was uh, in the Air Force during, during the Vietnam era. And uh, I guess it's a complicated story, but uh, uh, I think that's really why the Nightcrawlers started playing music in 1991. I don't think Peter wanted to go on uh, with the Nightcrawlers if Tom couldn't be in it. And after 1991, his physical condition had deteriorated to such a level that he was not able to function in, in that capacity. And that was the end of the Nightcrawlers after the Barriers cassette came out, uh, which is uh, it's a sad, it's sad to think about. Because boy, Tom, that guy was really alive. That was, and in many ways, he meditated every day. He set aside some time to do transcendental meditation. He had like, he had really interesting views on the world and on music and on everything. It was hard to, it was hard to tell him or to teach him anything. I don't know if he ever learned anything from me, but he seemed like he knew it all already, you know. But, uh, but he was a good man and, uh, and, he really meant a lot to me and, and on, on many different levels. Peter Gulch, I'm still, I still consider him a close friend even today. And I, I guess, you know, it's been over 30 years that I've been friends with him. And we have a friendship on many different levels. And Peter has really taught me a lot over the years. And the, I remember the first big um, revelation or the, the first big um, confirmation that I got from him was during one of those on-air interviews that I was just explaining about. And uh, while we were, you know, the interviews would cover areas of their music and, and, you know, sometimes just basic background information or whatever, but I realized after a while that it was also a good avenue to maybe explore more, uh, you know, esoteric um, ideas too. So I asked, uh, I asked the Nightcrawlers what it would take to, for someone to uh, begin to start out doing this music. Like, what would it take? Like, do you would it be possible for someone without any musical background, like someone who didn't know how to play the piano or the organ, or knew how to read music? Would it be possible for a person like that to make anything worthwhile using a synthesizer? And so, Tom, you know, I was thinking of myself. Because I didn't, actually I guess what I wanted to do was, I didn't want to go to school for four years to learn how to do any kind of art. I wanted to do something that, something different, but but was still personal and still ex, was, a, was, a, uh, was a true expression. So I posed that question and uh, Tom said, well you're not going to be able to do very much because if you don't understand basic music theory or you don't know you know how about chord structure you're you're not going to be able to do anything except make make 
bleeps and bloops. And it's just going to sound atonal. And so then Peter says, yeah, but you know, when we first started out, we made, that's all we did was make bleeps and bloops, and it was all atonal. And we gradually learned more about the music aspect on it as, as we developed. And so Peter, basically, he was, I don't know if he said it over the air, but he was very encouraging to me then and onward to try to, to buy a synthesizer. So I did. I took a class at the com Community College of Delaware County, uh, an electronic music class. And uh, I met, I made some friends in the class, and one of the guys had a Korg MP4, a Monopoly, and I bought it off of him. And that was my first, you know, it was a, it was a great leap of faith because I didn't want to buy something and then, you know, get frustrated with it and not be able to do anything with it and just have it sit, gather dust, because that's probably what would have happened. And so I started making my own cassettes, just like they were doing, except I was multi-tracking it, doing like a, you know, I was, I taught myself how to do that basically and how to make, you know, try, try to make like a, like a more concise version, not so sprawling or, you know, with, uh, you know, with as few mistakes as possible. So I made a cassette called Runway. So I remember I, I had, a, you know, I was just starting out, I made this piece of music and for some reason they came over to my house in, in Upper Darby, uh, they, the three of them visited. I don't remember if they were on some, their way to somewhere or they were picking up something, but that was unusual, you know, they came to the house and, uh, well, my mom and dad, my mom and dad were always happy to see, uh, see you know, see, have people come over and, uh, and you know, the three of those guys, they were like real, real characters. And so we, we had actually, I forgot about this, we had a real nice encounter. My mom got, had made a cake and she made, gave us all cake. And, and, um, and we sat around the dining room table and we had a, re a really nice afternoon, or I mean, for a little while at least. But, but they came over and whatever they came over for, they didn't come over for the cake. But the, the, I, played, I played this uh, premixed, uh, you know, I just played the, the, the four track master of the of this piece runway and they they said I think Tom said he said you know um, this piece of music you made it's it's like you've been doing this for several years like very few people who are, are like at, at their first attempt come up with the music that's this put together you know that's this uh, construct well constructed and and conceived and uh, and Peter and Dave agreed and they were very encouraging to me and th that was very meaningful to me but for some reason that that was maybe it was my age or maybe I really needed to hear something like that but it was very encouraging to me and it really meant a lot especially when Peter said something to me. Was, I really listened hard I tried to listen carefully to what he what he would say and what he would talk about For one thing, I really like the more melodic, sequencer, rhythmic, pulse-driven music. And it seemed like, oh, these spacey parts were just an interlude in between, you know, the more uh, focused areas. Uh, but I realized that that is an end in itself, is just making these sound collage or these atonal soundscapes. And I think in his heart of hearts, that's what Peter liked the most himself. Like, um, they would do all these... Um, these sound collage jam sessions amongst themselves, but as time passed and they were called upon to do concerts here and there, and and, and eventually they disciplined themselves to make like more uh, more music that was more well formed or more conventionally formed. Um, you know, they could play that way for an audience to give them a um, to give them like a uh, you know a basis or a foothold or an access point into the music. But I think overall he really savored and enjoyed those sound collage moments and, and, and the interaction and the, uh, you know, the construction and the improvisation of doing that. He might have liked, you know, the, the, the state his mind got into, he might have liked that more than actually the process of making the music or releasing the music. It seems like it's a, uh, that's, that's a method to get into a, uh, this special mental state. This is really amazing. And 
I still have that moment to myself now. Like when I hear somebody doing like some really weird sound design, like atonal music, where it's just layers of, or, or maybe some really unexpected or unique or unusual patch or something, you know, something especially interesting happens in a piece. I can hear him in my mind saying, will you listen to this? You know, it's like, he's he means like still yourself and fully absorb what is happening. Like, you know, this guy, whoever's do, whoever's this person is ever doing this music is way out, is way out on the fringe. Like, I don't know how they're ever going to get back, you know? And I mean, he wasn't saying that, but I, but I if verbally, but that's what I took out of it. And I always appreciated that because I, I played music with Peter in, uh, at some point he came and, and, and into the group Exile and Peter Gulch, Dana Rath and myself played in Exile and uh, Peter and I did an album together called Regeneration Mode. Uh, we played many, uh, we played several concerts together, just the two of us and we formed the Ministry of Inside Things as a live performing group and um, we played a whole bunch of concerts that way, just the two of us. We went, in 1995, we played a concert at the Emma Festival in Sheffield, England. And gosh, that was a huge night. You know, like years later, I realized that that's where Air Sculpture had their first concert. I mean, of that kind of music, of electronic space music. And that's the first time Radio Massacre International played together, you know, officially. Um, I think they had Jam, there were in other configurations before that. At that event, Ron Boats played, John Dyson played. There was this group called Bleep and Blues Booster. They were really good. Um, I don't know if I can remember all of them. Um, th and, and also, uh, Peter Gulch and I played, it was called Van Zyl and Gulch. And Ian Boddy and Andy Pickford did a set together. They were like the top, top of the bill. And uh, we, uh, and, it was a heck. It was a heck of an experience, you know. We. He he just has a different perspective on life, and I really have. I, I've really appreciated that over the years. We 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 have gotten to be really good friends, and it's just gotten. Well, I don't know. He's he's. He he just is. He's he's you know he's just in here. He's like part of. He, he's a close friend. We we've. We've done some extraordinary things together musically, you know, playing playing these concerts I've outlined. But we've also had you know really interesting experiences um, traveling. You know, Peter is he really enjoys learning things, and 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 so the the, the these hall experiences were not like typical vacations where you know you go to relax or uh, you go to the typical tourist spots. I really learned about a lot about the world and about each other. Now, now he, uh, as as Peter's age has advanced, uh, you know, he has suffered from, you know, some physical setbacks, and so um, he, he slowed down quite a bit. So we don't play music together anymore, but but we still uh, we still get together about once a month at a at a diner in Philadelphia, and uh, and I look forward to that every month. Thank you. 